Okay, here we go. We're going to try this again. I got about halfway through and all of a sudden everything went blank. I don't know what it is. I think my computer's getting overworked here after the past couple of weeks. But anyway, uh, and what we need to talk about in this last uh, PowerPoint video uh, in, in the digestive system, the gastrointestinal system, are, are basically the ancillary organs of the GI system, basically talking about the pancreas as well as the liver and the gallbladder. Okay, All of these are very important organs, and they all have a, uh, play a significant part in what goes on in our digestive processes. So let's get started. Let's first talk about the pancreas, okay? If we look here, here's my pancreas, okay? My pancreas is is um, is a gland, okay? And it has what's called a head, and this area right here would be the head. This area would be the body right in here. And this area right here is called the tail. So I have the head, body, and tail. Now, if you look here, what happens, here's that C loop of the duodenum and how that head of the pancreas and a little bit of the body sits within that C loop. That's really important. Um, the, the duodenum as well as the pancreas, with the exception of maybe this area out here, are all retroperitoneal, which means that they're covered over by the peritoneum and held to the back side of the abdominal wall. I can't get to the pancreas without getting behind the stomach. You have to go behind the stomach. So it lies posteriorly and inferior to the stomach. And again, we protect that, that, that little epiploic foramen or that foramen Winslow, where we have that mesentery, the lesser omentum, that connects the liver to the stomach, to that lesser, lesser curvature of the stomach. And there's that little hole that you go inside there to get back in back, back by the by the duodenum, but so the head of the duodenum, okay, the head of the du, the uh, head of the duodenum, in here, sits within that C loop of the, uh, or the head of the pancreas, excuse me, sits within the, the C loop of the duodenum, okay? So that's all sits in there. Um, the pancreas usually has two ducts, at least, you know, it has one duct and, and quite often two ducts, okay? And we sort of see this in this image right here. Here's the duct that's coming this way, and we see it comes this way and comes this way. And it sort of divides somewhere in the body, where the body and the head meet, and empties into the duodenum. Okay, here's the duodenum comes down this way, empties into the duodenum. There's a little hole that empties into, it's called the sphincter of Odi. It has a little sphincter around that little opening that will control the amount of pancreatic enzymes that are being squirted into the area of the duodenum, okay? So it empties into the duodenum. One other thing I think is important to show at this point, okay, is that if we look underneath the side, underneath the, the, the liver right here, here's the gallbladder. Here's the gallbladder sitting right here. And the gallbladder has a duct, okay? And let me draw that duct in like this, okay? Let me draw a duct here. The duct comes out this way and comes down, and actually uh, it's formed by a couple other things. I'll talk about that in just a second. Comes down here and goes behind the pancreas and actually meets with the pancreatic duct. And most times they empty at that same spot, that little sphincter of Odi. Okay. Most of the time, the duct that drains the gallbladder and the duct that drains the pancreas, with the enzymes from the pancreas and the and the um, and the uh, uh, bile from the gallbladder, they meet together and they empty into the same spot in the duodenum. Okay. But where did this come from? What happens is, let me just give you a little preamble here. This up here is the liver, obviously. Okay. This is the liver. Okay. And if I look at the liver, the liver has a, a duct here, which is called the right hepatic duct. And left a pack duct. So various juices like bilirubin and stuff like that come. We have a duct that comes from the from the left, a duct that comes from the right, and there's it's called the right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct. Okay, what happens? They meet. When two things meet, the word for that is common. Common. C O M M O N. They meet together. So we have a right hepatic duct meets a left hepatic duct and becomes what's called the common hepatic duct. Okay, that common hepatic duct continues on down. It meets the cystic duct, and when it meets the cystic duct, it becomes what's called the common bile duct. Okay, so basically, these we have two ducts coming from each side of the liver. I, they come together as a common uh, hepatic duct. It meets the cystic duct, which comes from the gallbladder, to create one duct, which is called the common bile duct. Okay, and over here on the right image here, you see, get, get the image. Here's the area of the common bile duct coming this way, and here's the hepatic duct, and you see how they sort of come together. This area right here is called the ampulla of Vater, and right here would be called the sphincter of Odi. The sphincter of Odi. 
you see it right down here sphincter of Odi and Pula of Vader sitting right there okay crazy names but that's what they are and that's how I get the um, uh, the bile from the gallbladder emptying into the duodenum along with the juices from the pancreas okay so that's just a little uh, information that you get right there uh, this is just another image that looks at the same thing pretty much what we've talked about there here's the pancreas right here okay this is actually this down here is a blow up the one above and you can see the gallbladder you know a gallbladder let me just start a different color here here's the gallbladder well it's not doing it very well Okay, here's the gallbladder up in here, cystic duct. And you can see where the two little ducts are coming from the from the one from the right side of the liver, one from the left side of the liver, and the right and the left hepatic duct. They meet to form the common hepatic duct in the middle, and they form a common bile duct, which then joins. Here's the common bile duct that joins the area of my pancreatic duct to go into and it, it, it balloons out, which is which is which is called the ampulla of water, and then empties into that little hole, which is called the sphincter of Odi. Same thing we see here. Here's the common bile duct coming down here. It sort of works its way through the through the pancreas, and it, it meets up with the pancreatic duct, and they empty into the area of that sphincter of Odi. Okay. Interestingly enough, too, again, up to about here, most of the pancreas as well as the duodenum is behind the peritoneum, except out here. This is the tail, and there's actually a little dent sometimes in the spleen that, where that tail of the pancreas sits. Okay, so that's just a little interesting fun fact. Okay, now what does the pancreas do? Okay, first of all, the pancreas has two major divisions within it. Okay, one part of it is called exocrine, and what I mean by exocrine is it's uh, they're, 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 they're glands with ducts. Okay, not D-U-C-K, but D-U-C-T, ducts. Okay, and what happens is they make a certain type of a solution. In this case, it's various types of enzymes, and they in, in the cells of the organ, okay, they're called acinar cells or acini cells, okay, A-C-I-N-A-R or A-C-I-N-I, both of them could be used. And what happens is that these acinar cells make the enzymes and they put the enzymes into the duct and the duct takes the enzymes down and deposits it, deposits them in the, in the duodenum, just like we showed before, okay. So because they do make enzymes, put them in a duct and the duct deposits is another organ, they're called exocrine, exocrine. And some of those uh, uh, materials materials that the that the uh, uh, pancreas will make will make amylase you know we've talked about amylase before lipase which breaks down breaks down uh, fats trypsin and chymotrypsin you know and carboxypeptidase they start to break down proteins so we have a number of enzymes that the pancreas is making you got to remember that once um, the material the garbage the soup the uh, slop the, the chyme medically leaves the stomach then what happens it's still not totally digested there's still all kinds of particles floating around in there and it's pretty 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 clumpy still so we still need digestion to occur in the small intestine and these enzymes that are put into the small intestine into the duodenum again into the what into the duodenum everybody with me into the duodenum are uh, helping to, to, to further more digestion uh, to uh, that, that for that to allow to be allowed to happen the second portion that we have in the pancreas is what's called endocrine. Endocrine are what are called ductless glands. Okay, we have a number of endocrine organs or endocrine glands in the body. What they do is they don't have a duct that deposits the materials they make into something. What they do is they make things called hormones. Okay, and these hormones are made and they're put into the circulation. They're put into the blood, and then the blood takes them to all over the body. Okay, um, and and the two major ones that the pancreas makes it makes a couple makes a metastatin but the two major ones are insulin and glucagon okay they're made in what are called the islets of Langerhans or the beta cells beta like in a you know Greek letter you know beta oh, let me do a beta oh, it's not writing again okay beta anyway it's a beta cell okay uh, a beat like a B you know uh, anyway what happens is uh, to make sure that they could be used all over the body as compared to just in the duodenum they put the hormones in the blood so what happens is when the, when I eat a meal and, I, and my blood sugar starts to go up I want to get that sugar inside the cell as an energy source right of course you know that from before how do I get it in there well the sugar just the glucose just can't normally leak in like you like putting a little you know sugar coating on a cereal or something like that it has to have a way to get in and the only, even though glucose is a small molecule, it needs a, a hormone called insulin. Once the pancreas puts out the insulin and it gets in the body, the insulin goes to receptors on the surface of the cells that allow, allow a door to open, let the let the let the glucose get in. Okay, so 
these are so the, the pancreas by having these enzymes is exocrine but by having the hormones is called endocrine and uh, well the, where the insulin lowers the blood sugar glucagon raises the blood sugar so these are just some of the things that the pancreas but it does other things and just just looking again looking at some of these enzymes you know amylase you know breaks down carbohydrates lipase breaks down fats uh, trypsin chymotrypsin carboxypeptidase break down proteins we also have nucleases and the nucleases are things that will actually uh, pull apart D, uh, DNA and RNA okay because everything we eat has some DNA and RNA in it so it does that so the, the pancreas has a number of things that it puts inside the, the duodenum to help further that digestion both starches fats proteins as well as nuclear materials okay uh, and this is again just looking at how the, the pancreas would be we could see the duodenum starting here and we can see the head of the pancreas sitting right there in the tail here's that pancreatic duct going up the middle emptying with that common duct at that area of the sphincter of Odi. Okay, and that's where both the bile from the gallbladder as well as the pancreatic enzymes from the pancreas are deposited in the duodenum. Okay, and then we know the duodenum starts right here because this right here is the pylorus. That's the pyloric sphincter that we'd see right at that spot. Okay, we've all known that from before. That's old hat. You should all have that down. Now, what controls uh, the, pa the pancreas. Uh, again, it's both under uh, parasympathetic control, okay? In other words, the parasympathetic nervous system will, will actually be part of the stimulus for the secretion of a lot of these enzymes, as well as hormones, okay? What happens is the pancreas uh, uh, receives stimulus from secretin, which actually causes the pancreas to secrete a bicarbonate-based bicarbonate mucus, Okay, and I'll talk about that in a second. And it also, and, and it also is sensitive to another hormone called cholecystokinase, and that uh, actually stimulates the pancreas to stimulate those, to make those um, uh, digestive enzymes. So we talked about in the previous slide. But you got to think about this. Remember, the stomach has what? A lot of acid in there, hydrochloric acid. When that stuff, that chyme, that soup gets spilled out through that pyloric sphincter into the duodenum, guess what? It's still pretty caustic. It's still pretty acidic. So we need to have the pancreas under the under the uh, influence of this hormone called secretin secrete this um, mucus, uh, this this uh, basic bicarbonate type mucus that coats the inside of the duodenum so the duodenum doesn't get burned. Sometimes if it doesn't work very well, they do get burns inside the duodenum, which result in duodenal ulcers. Duodenal ulcers occur just like gastric ulcers. Gastric ulcers inside the stomach, duodenal ulcers. Again, because so close, there's still a lot of acid that has to be neutralized even in the duodenum. Okay, so you got to remember that. That's an important factor. You can see there it's a secretin in the colchicinin. So that's pretty much the pancreas. Um, it, it, you, you, there's probably one thing that's on your mind, okay? The pancreas makes these enzymes that are basically destructive. They're basically will eat things up or dissolve things. Why don't those enzymes dissolve the pancreas? Hmm, good question for the thinkers out there, okay? Uh, if you didn't think about it, now you're thinking about it. If you had these enzymes in the pancreas, and the pancreas is meat, why doesn't it start to digest the pancreas? Well, here's the, here's the answer. What happens is the enzymes, when they're in the pancreas, are not active. They're in a precursor inactive form. Once they're secreted outside into the, into the area of the duodenum, the bicarbonate and other uh, chemicals that are in the duodenum will activate them will activate the uh, the enzymes and the enzymes will start to work once they get outside the pancreas. However, there are some situations where this doesn't occur that way. One is called pancreatitis. Okay, and pancreatitis, uh, the enzymes start to build up inside the pancreas and what happens, they start to become active inside the pancreas too soon. And they start to create more and more juice and they start to eat up the pancreas and what happens the pancreas and the body then tries to wall this off tries to make a pocket over the top of the pancreas and it's called a pancreatic pseudocyst it's right behind the stomach okay and those could be nasty uh, also this is um, sort of something that you should know about um, they always talk about pancreatitis occurs in alcoholics but uh, pancreatitis occurs equally as much in people with a gallstone and what happens is think about that. If I look at where that that uh, that common duct comes down, if it meets with the pancreatic duct at the same spot and they join, think about this. If I have a stone that comes out of the gallbladder and goes down that cystic duct, 
goes down the cystic duct and goes down the the, the common common bile duct and gets to where it meets the pancreatic duct and that stone blocks not just the cystic duct but the pancreatic duct all the enzymes start to back up inside the inside the pancreas it's a highly uh, significant and very dangerous situation my dad um, in October 1989 had a gallstone the gallstone went down through the common duct blocked the pancreatic duct and he got really really sick okay they finally were trying to do it without surgery they had to go into surgery they took him to surgery um, and it was a mess. He was in ICU for probably um, four to five weeks after the surgery because it's it's a de it's a because all these enzymes are just eating up the inside. Once they get down there, the, the enzymes get activated. They were eating up and ripping up the inside of them. And um, so finally, he got out of the hospital. Was home for a couple months after, and then just before Christmas, um, he was complaining of some abdominal pain. Went back. They did a scope. Found out the backside of his stomach was gone, eaten away because there were still enzymes back there that were eating things away. They took him in uh, because his belly got infected. They took him in the day after uh, Christmas in 1989, and he died uh, uh, the second week in January, um, basically from a pulmonary embolus. But after the anesthesia of the surgery, he never came out of the anesthesia. It was an ICU and got a pulmonary embolus. So the, the biggest problem was the pancreas. So anyway, the pancreas is a really important organ. Um, one other bad thing about the pancreas is um, pancreatic carcinoma, a cancer of the pancreas. The problem is the pancreas is tucked back in there such a, in such a way that sometimes um, pancreatic carcinomas can be lethal. And the reason why they're lethal in such a way is because what we find is by the time people get symptoms, it's usually gone out. It's involved a lot of things. It involved the duodenum, obviously because it's sitting right there, the liver, the stomach, the intestines, everything sits on top. So as a result, pancreatic carcinoma is a really big problem. When they do, when they, when somebody does have a pancreatic carcinoma, just for your information, uh, sometimes the surgery they do is called a Whipple. And when they go in for the Whipple, it's probably about eight to ten hours. They go in and take everything that they can out. They take out part of the stomach. They take out, the, you know, as much as they can. They take out part of the liver. They take out the gallbladder. They take out some of the pancreas, as much of the pancreas they could get with the tumor. And again, not all pancreatic tumors are amenable to even surgical intervention. So that's a problem. But anyway, that's a little bit about the pancreas. Let's go to the next organ, which gets no credit at all for anything. It's one of these organs that's, my gosh, you know, it should have a, a lot of credit because it does so many things. It's called the liver. The liver is a solid organ, it's an accessory organ of the gastrointestinal system. It sits in the right upper quadrant, which you should know because basically, you know, you should know that, you know. Um, we talked a little about this before. It's actually suspended by the liver or by the, from the liver or for the, from the diaphragm by this little pelvis from ligament, which is basically where the peritoneum comes together and folds in and creates a little tether that holds the um, uh, the liver to the undersurface of the diaphragm. Diaphragm. Another interesting thing that's in the diaphragm is this thing right here. You can see a little hole right there. It looks like a little tube. Okay, and it's really not. That's called the round ligament. Well, what the round ligament came from, and this is sort of cool. Okay, is uh, in the fetus. Um, how much is the kid eating? Well, you gotta say nothing. I mean, you can't throw some mashed potatoes down there or uh, a burger or fries or uh, corn or chips or anything. The kid's not going to eat a donut. So where's it getting its nutrition? It's getting its nutrition from the maternal circulation. And then what happens, the maternal circulation meets a membrane inside the uterus, which is where the placenta is. It crosses this membrane, gets into the placenta, and then the placenta takes it through the umbilical um, umbilical cord through the vessels in the umbilical cord into the through the through the navel okay because you obviously in a baby with the little little um, dried up thing that parents will sometimes save in a book somewhere when it falls off but anyway that's up where they where they clamp it off and then they cut the cord okay what happens is inside the abdomen there's another tube in the fetus that goes straight up the inside of the abdomen along the inside of the peritoneum and goes right to the liver okay it's stuck to the inside abdominal wall okay it goes right up to the liver and that's the, the tube that takes it's a it's a vessel one of the umbilical vessels that actually takes the nutrients from the placenta to the fetus and where does it go well just like all the other nutrients to the liver first remember we, we talked about the last thing when the intestines the small intestine and part of the large intestine are drained of all the nutrients when all the nutrients are absorbed in that area where do they go first place they go is to the liver they go through that portal vein, okay? The, super mes the, the superior mesenteric vein to the portal vein to the liver. And so this way, in the fetus, they also get first dibs on the blood from that um, umbilical vein that goes
goes up and, and then after birth once that cord is clamped and the kids on the outside we don't need it anymore it sort of closes off and becomes like a cord and you can actually see this cord on the inside of the abdominal wall and that's called the round ligament okay the liver, if you really read the textbooks, they'll say it has four lobes. You have to know this lobe, and you know, you know, quadrate, coordinate, right, and left, and stuff like that. Who cares? You know, uh, it basically is two parts: a left liver and a right liver, a left liver and a right liver, a left liver and a right liver. There will ask four lobes. Someone will ask, "How many lobes does the liver have?" Trying to look really cool, you say four. You know, um, and and uh, they say, "Yeah, but it's basically a left liver and a right liver." Liver, okay. The gallbladder is stuck to the inferior side of the liver. Okay, the liver. You got to remember is covered over by the by the visceral peritoneum, and the and the, there's some uh, connective tissue that holds the gallbladder to the bottom side of the liver, and then when the peritoneum comes to it, it goes over the top of the gallbladder and over. Okay, so that it's covered by the peritoneum, and we talked about this before when we talked about those ducts. We talked about how my how we have. Well, let me do a different color here. I have my uh, right hepatic duct meets the left hepatic duct. It becomes a common hepatic duct, and then my common hepatic duct meets my cystic duct to become the common bile duct. We talked about that before, okay? And again, it usually joins with at least one of the branches of the pancreatic duct. Sometimes it does. Sometimes they actually exit the duodenum right next to each other, you know, like two spots right next to each other. And that area where they meet, okay, is called the ampulla of vater. You can actually see it over here, okay? See where it gets wide right, right in the middle? You know, it gets wide. That's called the ampulla of water. Okay, you see it says ampulla of water right there. And then here, right here, would be that little sphincter, and that's that sphincter of OD, O D D I. Okay, sphincter of OD. Um, the the blood supply again is the hepatic artery. Now, where did the hepatic artery come from? Well, you should know, because remember we talked about in the vascular system that celiac trunk. One of the major branches that came off the celiac trunk was the hepatic artery. So as soon as the aorta goes through the diaphragm, the first branch that goes off of it is the cel from the from the is a, is a celiac artery, a celiac trunk. And um, one of the main branches that comes off the celiac trunk is the hepatic artery, hepatic vein, hepatic vein. Uh, let me just let me let's let's do the portal vein first. Why? Because the portal vein's always in, in big letters. But what happens is we know that portal vein is actually the combination of that splenic vein and the superior mesenteric. They come together, they form the portal vein, and the portal vein takes the nutrients to the liver. They, and what happens in the liver, there are little open spots, they're called sinusoids, all over through the liver. And this is where the blood mixes and brings all the nutrients and everything is, is arranged in these little sinusoids. And, and there's right lobe and left lobe sinusoids, and, and things are, are happening in there. Uh, medic, medications are being activated. Things are getting, getting are, are, are working. You're taking out the nutrients. You're making albumin because the liver makes that albumin that we've talked about so much before. It makes all that stuff. All this happens in these sinusoids. And funny, there's still a lot of nutrients left. And the liver says, I got to send this out to the rest of the body. It sends it out through the hepatic vein. The hepatic vein goes to the area of the inferior vena cava, and the inferior vena cava takes it back to the area of the right, right side of the heart, as we should all know, okay? So basically, that's what's going on in the liver. And this just shows you another picture of the liver. You can see the gallbladder on the bottom, okay? Uh, for some reason, this one doesn't go. And it's gonna do this again. Okay, let's hope, that, yep, it's still going. For some reason, I fool around with this picture and it, and it stops, so I'm not going to touch it. Okay? You can see the gallbladder, that green thing that's underneath there, and that's under under surface, and that's where the bile is. Okay? Uh, and the bile is made by the liver. Okay? And then what happens is you see how it meets with the with the pancreatic duct and empties into that area of the duodenum. Okay? So that's what, and you can see the falciform ligament, that little pinkish thing that sort of like looks to the left side of the liver and the right side of the liver. Okay? That's that. You can see this, and also if you see that purple thing on the right side, I'm not going to touch the screen because it's going to go off. See this purple thing on the right side? That's the spleen. See that blue thing coming from it that's going over? Guess what that is? That's the splenic vein. You see the blue thing that's coming from the bottom? Looks like it has little feet coming out of it? That's the superior mesenteric vein. And you see just below the liver where those two little blue things come together? That's the portal vein going into the liver. Boom! Got it. Okay? Can't be much clearer than that. Okay? So anyway, that's that's the liver. Uh, again, each liver has a central vein. You know what happens is once that once we once the portal vein gets at the central vein divides, okay, and goes into goes into um, these what are or, you know areas that were these they're, they're called sinusoids. They're, they're it's filled with the liver. So each each lobule of the, has a central vein and around it a bunch of liver cells that are around a duct. And the duct is actually what's going to make the bile. 
and the other materials that the, that the liver is going to secrete. So what, where does the bile come from again? That's made in these little uh, these little uh, hepatocytes that they, what hepato means liver, sites means cells, liver cells. What they make again, dead and dying red blood cells are taken, they're broken up by the spleen, the iron is recycled, they take the protein, part of the hemoglobin, send it to the liver, the liver breaks it down and breaks it down in, in, in these areas with the hepatocytes and it makes the bile. It makes a material called biliverdin, Biliverdin is converted to bilirubin. Bilirubin is further converted where initially it's not water soluble, it's only oil soluble, and then it's converted to be a water soluble, which then and, and then it gets in the circulation and stuff like that. But some of that bilirubin then gets mixed with cholesterol and other things, and, and it's, that's what's forced into the area of the of the gallbladder, and that's formed as bile. And bile emulsifies fats. Okay, uh, again, that blood flows in from the hepatic artery and the portal vein. It mixes. So now I have arterial blood mixing with with um, uh, with uh, uh, portal vein blood, nutrients and oxygen. Hmm, good mix, okay? And what happens is they go to the central vein and then they finally go out out the area to the um, to the area of the inferior vena cava, okay? Uh, again, that portal vein, you know, has all the nutrients that have been absorbed in the small intestine. I think you should remember that. Remember that. If you know that, you know about 95% most more than most of the people in a lot of the other A&P, okay? Please remember that. I'll be, I'll be so happy if you remember that. Okay. Uh, again, what does the liver do? It excretes bile. It makes that bile. What does bile do? It mechanically breaks down flat fat globules into smaller globules and sort of what's called emulsifies it. It almost liquefies it. Okay. It does that. And so as a result, what happens is when it breaks it down and liquefies it into smaller globules, the other things like the lipase and stuff like that work better. If I have a big globule of fat and a little lipase, it's not making much of a dent. But if I have small globules, that lipase works a lot better. It's involved in a carbohydrate anabolism because what happens, we talked about a couple times before, the glucose can't be stored in the body. But what happens is the glucose and the carbohydrates go to the liver, and the liver manufactures what we call glycogen. And the liver stores this glycogen, which is basically a carbohydrate for later use. It's a storage form, okay? And so it helps to do that. Also, what happens is when I need that glycogen, if my glucose levels go down, and I need the glycogen, the liver says, okay, I got to give you up. And what it does is it starts to cut it up. So that's what we call carbohydrate catabolism. It builds it up, anabolism, the glycogen, breaks the glycogen down, carbohydrate, carbohydrate catabolism. Also that glycogen stored in skeletal muscle. It's involved in lipid uh, anabolism, which is basically helping to make the cholesterol, because the cholesterol is combined with the with the with the bilirubin to make the bile, as well as lipid catabolism. It breaks things down. People who are taking um, uh, uh, cholesterol lowering agents. Okay, if you have a family member who's taking a cholesterol lower aging, you know, Lipitor. Um, uh, 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 you know, there's a there's a num simvastat and all kinds of different uh, drugs that you take to, to decrease your, your blood lipids. What happens? They frequently have to go for liver tests, liver function tests. Why? Because the liver is involved in helping to break down the fats as well. And so when the fats are there, one way we get rid of them is breaking them down so I could get rid of them. And the liver is responsible for that. And the medications will actually make it go faster. So uh, the liver is also involved in protein anabolism. Well, the most important one we talk about there was 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 when we talked about uh, uh, how albumin is such an important protein. It's a relatively small size protein, but it's so important because that's what keeps the fluid in the in the vessels. It, it keeps the liquid in the vessels and it's it's important for repair and stuff like that. So it's involved with all kinds of different and that's what we call a plasma protein because <coughs> plasma is the liquid portion of blood as we all know. And the plasma protein, such as albumin, and there's another one called globulin, and globulin is another protein that the liver is involved in making, but the albumin keeps the fluid in, okay? So that's a couple things. Liver also makes a clotting factors. It makes some um, uh, some vitamins, okay? It activates some vitamins. I mean, it just does so many things that you wouldn't think it does, but it does all these things, which is actually a pretty cool thing about the liver. Liver, uh, liver failure is a horrible way to die because it causes so many so many problems all over. Okay, uh, so again, it's, it's also involved in the detoxification, removal and detoxification of drugs and hormones, as well as activating many drugs so they become become um, become useful. It's involved in phagocytosis. In other words, what the liver does is sometimes it will um, uh, help in the fighting of 
uh, foreign materials that are into the, in the body. And phagocytes are white cells that will actually go eat these things up. They're called macrophages. They actually go and eat stuff up. And the liver has a big responsibility with that. They're involved with the storage in, uh, of vitamins and minerals and activation of vitamin D, like I mentioned, and stuff like that. And the thing about it is, is and this makes no... Uh, you, you, you only have to worry, wonder about this. When they talk about cancers, okay, um, there were, I, tell, I used to tell my PA students, if a cancer is going to metastasize, which means spread, I, I think of, if you don't know where it is, think of the four L's. Lymph nodes, because it goes frequently by lymphatic st uh, spread, uh, lung, long bone, and liver because liver gets a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff goes there um, it's trying to clean things up it's trying to detoxify stuff uh, it has a, gr a huge blood supply for doing all this stuff so the liver is a, is a very very common place to have cancer metastasize or spread to simply because it's a very central organ much more than we ever give it credit for again it's under neural control oh parasympathetic as well as hormonal control and stuff like that which help in regards to uh, uh, squeezing stuff out of the gallbladder, such as uh, it makes a secretin, which with, which with, with bicarbonate and cholecystokinin, also for ball. That's 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 just that shouldn't be gallbladder. It should be gallbladder. Okay, mechanisms and stuff like that. Okay, uh, the gallbladder, and then we'll tie this up with the gallbladder. And the gallbladder is a pear-shaped organ. It's a it's a sac. It's a bag. Okay, it's about oh about uh, seven to ten centimeters in size. Okay, it's on the ventral or undersurface of the liver. Again, it's connected to the undersurface of the liver by some connective tissue, and the peritoneum cover covers over it, so it it binds it up as well as along with that. Cystic duct. The cystic duct is interesting, and this is a, just another little fun fact. When the cystic duct comes out of the gallbladder, it actually goes and it makes a, a goes back on itself and it comes back. It makes a little S, a very dramatic S, and it creates like a little valve. Okay, so we're not squirting a lot of stuff inadvertently into the duodenum. Okay, uh, so the peritoneum surrounds it, and again, the hepatic surface of the gallbladder is attached to the liver by by connective tissue, like I talked about. Okay, and here we see it again. What do we? What's the liver good for? It's for storage of bile. It's for storage of the bile. When I need bile for digestion, uh, particularly digestion of fats, it's released into the duodenum by the common bile duct. Okay, the common bile duct. Get it's the, the gallbladder has muscle in the wall, and when when I need the bile to be able to uh, break down and emulsify fats, the gallbladder will squeeze, and by squeezing like a tube of toothpaste, it squeezes the bile, which is thicker, okay, out through that duct and into the duodenum, okay, like we talked about before. So and so the bile, you know, will, will come there as well as bile from the you know from the hepatic duct. The bile, the, the liver is making the bile and the bilirubin, so some of that will also come out with the bile from the gallbladder, okay. Um, a couple of interesting things is we see uh, gallbladder problems more commonly in females, more commonly in females who are over 40, more commonly females who are over 40 that are a little bit more obese. Okay, and what usually brings it on is guess no 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 question here, fatty meals. They eat a fatty meal, all of a sudden they get this cramping pain in the right upper quadrant, which everybody knows what the right upper quadrant is, because the gallbladder is trying to squeeze and maybe there's a stone or swelling of the duct and I can't get the bile out. The gallbladder says, I got to squeeze, get that bile out, squeezes, nothing's going. It says, relax, take it easy, back off. No, no, I got to do this. It squeezes again. And it comes in waves. That's called colicky pain, which we frequently see with the gallbladder. Okay, so that's what you see. And there's that same picture with the ampulla of otter and the sphincter of Odie that we had before. Okay, and there it is again. There's my gallbladder. Like, you know, not my gallbladder, but you see the gallbladder sitting up in there. I better not touch it. This is another one that might cause a problem. You see the gallbladder and how it goes and how the cystic duct. See, there's that little S-shaped curve in the cystic duct, which that little kink in it actually is like a little valve. And then you see where it meets the common hepatic duct, which is basically a combination of the right and left hepatic ducts at the top, and they come together and forms that common bile duct. That's a great picture that shows that and shows how that common bile duct is meeting with the pancreatic duct in the pancreas in that. C loop of the duodenum and empties into that sphincter of Odie or through the sphincter of Odie. And you see the same thing on the image on the right with the bot with the with, with the gallbladder. Okay. Uh, again, bile is produced in the liver and stored in the gallbladder, like I mentioned, and the gallbladder concentrates uh, concentrates it. What happens is once I get the bile that's in the gallbladder, now it would take out a lot of water and concentrates it, make it like you know a much more concentrated form of the bile. It absorbs the water and the salts that are around that bile and 
puts them back in the circulation and makes it makes it a thicker, more gooey material. Sometimes if you have a fatty meal and you vomit a little bit, and there's that brownish, bitter tasting stuff. Guess what? That's probably bile. So when you get food in the duodenum, particularly fat material, the gallbladder squeezes and secretes the bile out into the duodenum to help to emulsify and liquefy the fats. Okay, a couple of things I just want to tie this up, you know, uh, with uh, uh, aging and the GI function. Don't look at me that way. I, look, I can see you looking through the computer at me. Uh, but aging and GI function. What happens we find with aging, it decreases the GI secretions. And those GI secretions are important in the digestive process. So the digestive process in old people has a tendency to be slower. If I combine the secretions, with, which help in the digestion to be slower, there's also a decrease in the intestinal motility. Those peristaltic waves, the peristalsis, just doesn't work quite the same okay in older people so it takes a little bit longer to go from mouth to anus okay it sounds bad but it takes a little bit longer to go there also they find that there's a loss of strength tone and control you know I, I, I'm gonna cross out control for me let me just cross out control you know I could control okay so a loss of strength tone and control so as a result things such as incontinence are a little bit more prominent in older people because the sphincters just don't work the way they did before okay Couple diseases here that I'll just mention a couple things about, and just just to just to give you an idea about where this all comes into place. First is GERD. We talked about that before. The gastroesophageal reflux. That's where that sphincter at the the lower esophageal sphincter doesn't close, and the and the acids go up into the stomach. We talked about that in um, our second lecture, our second video uh, PowerPoint, and we also talked a little about peptic ulcer disease. Peptic ulcer disease is just when I have a loss or an attrition of the mucus that's, that's, that covers the inside of the, the stomach, when that's gone, all of a sudden it exposes the stomach wall, the stomach lining, the mucosa to the acids that causes burning. And, and that causes a problem. Sometimes, uh, most ulcers, if you give them time, they'll heal. Decrease the, uh, decrease the acid. We talked about using sometimes an antibiotic, which is that H. pylori, which is that bacteria that sometimes causes a problem with the mucus in there. Uh, but uh, uh, if you leave most ulcers and you, you, you treat them conservatively, most of them will heal. If they're right next to a vessel, they may cause bleeding, which is a problem. Very rarely do they get so deep they actually perforate and make a hole in the stomach and to the outside. If that's the case, then all of a sudden you have the gastric contents that are leaking in the abdominal cavity. <laughs> all the acids now being separated or spread around, that's a bad thing, okay? It doesn't happen all that often, hopefully. Uh, hepatitis. Hepatitis is just an infection of the liver. And I put here viral, bacterial, and toxic. There are a lot of things that will cause the liver to have a problem. Problem. Most of the hepatitis we talk about now is probably viral. There's a number of different types of hepatitis A, B, C, D, all the way down the road, and tons of them. Some of which are easier to treat, some of them which are, are rapidly destructive to the liver. But there's a whole myriad of those. Cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is where the liver, instead of being nice and healthy with nice hepatocytes, becomes scarred. Usually scarred, the most common cause of cirrhosis is either hepatitis or alcoholism, okay? And what happens, instead of having a nice beefy, brownish red, firm liver, it becomes lumpy, bumpy, and scarred, and, and, and more yellowish and constricted. Now, here's a problem. What happens is, you gotta remember that that portal vein is a big vein, it comes into a liver that's now smaller and squished. It takes that portal vein and squeezes it. It causes the pressure to back up in the portal vein through the splenic, vein through the superior mesenteric vein, which then causes some problems. One problem is the, 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 the hemorrhoidal veins that go around the area of the anus come directly from the superior mesenteric, and those get all blown up. So people usually have more problems with hemorrhoids. Well, big deal, pain in the rear end, but that's about it, okay? Second thing that happens is around the umbilicus, there's veins that come and they, they radiate out like a starburst from around the umbilicus, and these get dilated. They get like big varicose veins in the, in the abdomen, Okay, it's called caput medusae. Caput means head, medusae means Medusa's head, and that's what it looks like. And that's a problem. You know, you know, you're not going to sit around on the beach or do some, uh, you know, uh, what's what's that uh, uh, Abercrombie and Fitch modeling or something like that. So that's not. But the big problem with the cirrhosis, and the, it's called portal hypertension. Portal hypertension is that there's some veins that are around the bottom of the esophagus that get big. And they get dilated and varicose and they may break. And when they break, there's a tremendous amount of bleeding in the GI tract, which in some cases can be significantly fatal rapidly. Okay. We already talked about pancreatitis, and pancreatitis is basically an activation of the pancreatic enzymes before they get out of the pancreas for one reason or another. We also mentioned a little bit about appendicitis. And appendicitis is basically uh it should be an end in there. 
appendicitis, not appendicitis. Uh, appendicitis is where that at the, at the cecum with that little blind tube that comes down there, uh, it gets jammed with all kinds of garbage, you know, seeds, nuts, uh, husks of things that don't digest with a lot of cellulose and stuff like that. And then bacteria go in there, they cause an infection and stuff like that. So that's the problem. We also talked about the diverticulosis and diverticulitis when I talked about the colon. It can occur in, in the small intestine as well as the colon, but these are the weakness of the of the outer wall that causes a little pouching. Now, in many cases, they don't cause a problem. However, if you get stuff that's jammed in there, it causes bacteria to sit inside there with like a little smorgasbord eating with all their friends. And as a result, what will happen is that will get what's called diverticulitis, and that could be a significant problem. Peritonitis. Peritonitis is just where we have infection or an inflammation of the peritoneum. And the peritoneum, we know the par parietal peritoneum. If you don't know this by now, I think this is the hundredth time. The parietal peritoneum covers the inside of the abdomen, the front of the abdomen, the back of the abdomen. And when that peritoneum that parietal peritoneum gets the back, it folds back on itself, becomes the mesentery, and then covers all the organs inside the inside the abdomen. The stomach, the liver, the spleen, uh, covers over the pancreas, covers over the duodenum, covers the rest of the small intestine with the with the with the mesentery that wraps around the, the intestine, the, the large large intestine, all these. And so when you have an infection inside there, that, that peritonitis spreads rapidly. Uh, a friend of ours, uh, their son, just uh, who my who my uh, younger son played hockey with uh, a number of years ago, uh, basically uh, was in the hospital until recently because what happened was he had appendicitis that was treated as a as gas by an emergency room because they were busy working on other things. Sent him home. And next day he got a fever. Was was became septic. They went and found out that he had an appendicitis and the appendix had ruptured. And when the appendix had ruptured, all of a sudden he has pus all over his abdomen, which caused a problem. IV antibiotics, all kinds of stuff. Okay. Last thing I'll just mention here is called inflammatory bowel syndrome, IBS, okay? Now, you might know somebody with inflammatory bowel syndrome. You see, if not, there's commercials on TV now talking about IBS. What IBS is, and they actually think that uh, inflammatory bowel syndrome is, a, is an autoimmune disorder, okay? Which means that um, it, for some reason, our immune system attacks part of our intestines, or, or part of my GI tract. Crohn's disease could occur anywhere from the mouth to the anus. It's could, anywhere along there. Along the There's a usual place. The usual place where Crohn's attacks is the area of the ileal cecal region, right where the ileum joins into this large intestine of the cecum. That's the most common area. But what happens is some people think that the gut bacteria, which I mentioned uh, in the last video PowerPoint, which are supposed to be there, the body looks at them as being abnormal and they set up an immune or, or an inflammatory response against them, which then causes inflammation of the gut wall, which then causes destructive changes. Okay, Crohn's disease is probably a lot more significant and severe because what happens is called also called regional enteritis, which means that there's little lesions all over the place Okay, and instead of one lesion. And what happens is, is the, the inside lumen of the gut swells and gets so thick that it actually sort of closes off, which is a bad problem, okay? And it causes an intestinal obstruction. And you know, air fluid levels, remember that? Air fluid levels, okay? Anyway, so as that may be a problem. Ulcerative colitis is different. Ulcerative colitis actually starts at the anus and works proximally. Starts at the anus, goes through the rectum, goes through the sigmoid colon, and goes up the descending colon. And it usually doesn't make it past where the descending colon gets just below the spleen where it goes to the transverse colon. Sometimes it does. But what happens, instead of having uh, the, the lumen narrowed off, they lose all those little pouches, the hostile pouches, and the, and the, and the bowel looks like a, just a, a thinner tube, okay? Because it's a very superficial ulcer that covers the hole inside of the colon, they bleed. So the people with ulcerative colitis have a tendency to have a lot more bleeding. The people with Crohn's disease have a tendency to have a lot more problems with obstruction. Okay, both of them are significant. Both of them are treated with auto with uh, with uh, things that will actually decrease the immune response to people. Okay, some of these quote biologic agents you see on TV, uh, and and which do have some problems associated with them, and they're also very expensive, but they can be used to treat some of these things. So these are just some of the gastrointestinal disorders. And I think we pretty much wrapped up most of the stuff I think I need you or would like you to know about the gastrointestinal system. Obviously, if you have any questions or anything about any of this material, please stop and me uh, on the uh, on the um, uh, 
by an email. Uh, let me know what you any questions you have because again the whole purpose about everything that we talk about here is for your understanding and your for, for your knowledge. Okay, uh, and also so you remember it. So when I start forgetting it as I get older and older and older, you can remind me what all this stuff means again. Okay. Anyway, so uh, we'll the next uh, video PowerPoint will be coming up in a couple of days, and that will be mostly involving the uh, urinary system, which is also quite interesting. Okay, and I'll talk to you later. Okay, be good, be safe, be happy, be healthy.